So let me begin by welcoming all of you and saying thank you so very much for joining us today for Nonprofit Power Week with Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. We are so thrilled to have Rita Sorenin, President and CEO, with us again today discussing impacting change with policy. And this is going to be a robust discussion that I am looking forward to. We're thrilled to have you back, Rita, and we're thrilled to, to dive in and learn more about the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption throughout the entire week of this week. Um, and so we also want to extend our gratitude, deepest appreciation to our presenting sponsors that allow us to have these dedicated weeks and thought leader episodes with people like Rita and the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. These companies exist to help you and your organization do more good to level up your mission in and around your community. So if you have not checked out our sponsors, please make sure you do that because uh, definitely with it being end of year, this is a big time that we all need a little bit of help. So <laughs> they, they are here to, to hand in hand be right there with you, as is Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, as am I, Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, sometimes Julia's private nonprofit nerd, but there's enough nerdiness to go around. I'm the CEO of the Raven Group and really excited to have this conversation with Rita today, again, as we talk about impacting change with policy. Welcome back, Rita. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here for day two. Thank you. Okay, this is like such an interesting question, because if you were with us yesterday, um, you spent some time listening to Rita and hearing the story of how this amazing foundation was started and the reason why it was started. My question now, 20 years later, do you think that Mr. Thomas would understand or not even understand, but maybe recognize how you've been invested in policy and and what that even looks like? I think absolutely he would, and I think he would applaud it. I hope he would applaud it. Um, when you think about the nature of the business that he was in and that he started, having to maneuver state and federal regulations, tax laws, interstate commerce, um, you know, all of the, the bits and pieces that went into creating a robust international business, it was just part of the DNA of what he did. So my sense is he believed that the foundation would also have that in its DNA, given this really important factor for the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, the populations we serve are inexorably linked with government systems. They're in the custody of counties and states. And so we're, we're tightly woven with those very entities and individuals, policymakers, um, change makers, people in charge who have to impact and implement policy on behalf of children. Well, if there are barriers to these children getting adopted, and there are many, then by nature, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption has to step into those policy and advocacy venues, or we're not gonna serve our children well. One of the things you said um, earlier was really knowing the difference of policy advocacy, lobbying, and I'm wondering if you could spend, you know, a, a little bit of time to really tell us the difference, um, because I do fear that many organizations and organizational leaders, you know, by nature as a 501c3 will say, oh, we can't do that. That's an area we cannot touch, or we are, you know, we are, we are, you know, playing with danger and we might have our 501 uh, restricted. So talk to us about how this is a focus for the foundation and why it's so much of a focus because of the, the differences. And, it, and it's a great question. And I think it's one that sometimes um, puts a barrier up for some nonprofits thinking uh, we couldn't possibly dip our toe into the world of policy change or advocacy or lobbying. And sometimes those words get confused. And it really is that lobbying. Well, first of all, that political piece. As nonprofits, we will never, never take a political position on who should be elected to, to an office, right? We can certainly have an open forum and ask, as, as a child advocates, ask all of the candidates, what's your position on X for children? Okay. How are we going to do better for children? But we're certainly not going to use our nonprofit budget budget in order to um, um, help 
an individual get elected. That's always a never. But that lobbying piece is very distinct from that. Lobbying is, is very specific in the, in the tax code that you will attempt to influence a yes or no vote on a, a specific piece of legislation. Or at a grassroots level, you'll attempt to get the community to do a yes or no vote on a piece of legislation, right? And you're allowed to do that. Look, it, nonprofits are uniquely positioned in these complex community conversations of the health and welfare of uh, individuals in the community. And the health and welfare of individuals in the, the community is always impacted by legislative change, right? That turns into policy that then um, demands advocacy. So there are, and I won't go into the, the deep detail, but it is a rare organization that will hit that financial threshold of what the IRS allows you to do in terms of lobbying. And there are tests for it. There are substantive tests and there are expenditure tests. So that, you know, whatever lobbying we do, and we do, we do some, but we don't do a lot, we won't even come close to the threat, the financial threshold that then puts our 501c3 at risk. We don't want to come close to that. That's not the main thing that we do, but we're not afraid of it. And so I would encourage other nonprofits to really look at what's your budget, what is your mission, where can you help enact legislative change that may quick, more quickly drive um, the best interest of the constituents you're serving. But take that aside, that notion of public policy, policy is implemented in, in so many different ways and advocacy is, is implemented in so many different ways. So for example, um, during COVID, we very quickly had to pivot our messaging and our advocacy for the children we serve who are in foster care waiting to be adopted to say, COVID is impacting these children in profound ways. They're at a higher risk of getting it. If they're in group homes, they're at a much higher risk of getting it. They're being separated already from families and others. And now with restrictions on movement, they're not seeing anyone. It's the trauma they've already experienced is being compounded by this, this pandemic. And so we, we immediately launched a campaign talking to the press, talking to the public, putting information out there. That kind of advocacy is so critical on behalf of our children. Now, were we advocating for something specific? Yes, when dollars began to open up um, during the pandemic for states and specifically for children and families in these situations, then making sure that organizations understood the dollars that were available to them by policy, right? That, that how they could access them, um, um, encouraging them not to forget their constituents and how these dollars can affect them. So that sense of advocacy going to the press. Uh, another example for us is, is having, we're very research focused. And so making sure that we have a, 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 um, a, a flooring of research that allows us to have uh, quality conversations with change makers, with policy makers that help educate them on the issues of foster care and foster care adoption. But then we have a basis if there is a specific piece of legislation that we think is important to then drive change in a bigger way. We've got that foundation from having advocated through research and then through policy change and then through legislation. So those are just some examples, but I think they're tightly woven yeah. But I think we all need to remember that as nonprofit leaders, as nonprofit employees, as nonprofit board members, as nonprofit donors, we have a unique position in the community and a unique responsibility to say, we understand what's happening for our most vulnerable children and families, whether it's foster care or, or food insecurity or housing insecurity or job insecurity, whatever the issue is, healthcare issues, we're in a unique position to understand the depth of those issues and then advocate for strategic change in order to better both the mission and the lives of those constituents. So it's, it's really powerful that you can have, you've explained to us some of these nuanced aspects that can come back and have tremendous impact positively or negatively. So I'm fascinated about, you know, your team and how they talk about policy, but hearing you speak, I want to ask a follow-up question. And that is, are you having to spend time with your board and your team explaining or saying the very things that you just said to Jarrett and I? Because I think a lot of people don't understand this. 
Ab ab absolutely. And, and it's, it's just in a way of clarifying. If okay. we're, for example, every few years we do a, a national survey of Americans' attitudes toward foster care and foster care adoption. Well, the reason for that is so that we can understand the barriers that exist with attitudes so that we can then impact um, by creating public service announcements that address perhaps the myths or misperceptions that we've discerned. Um, and at the board table, for example, I've had a, a board uh, member ask me, well, do you really, do, you know, public service announcements, does anybody really watch them anymore? What is the purpose behind them? Because we're spending a little bit of money to create them, right? Right, um, right. And, we, and that's when you say, well, if we step back and look at what our advocacy role is in this organization, how we've gotten to what the content of that public service announcement is, and then the dispersal of, and, and where we disperse that public service announcement, yeah. it's just not on TV. It might be in a, a civic um, uh, keynote presentation that we're doing um, where you're again, talking to change makers. So, so I think, yes, there, there's, there's inherent in that, not assuming that everybody's at the same place and understanding the value of it yeah. or understands perhaps the misperceptions behind what lobbying advocacy and public policy work is particularly as we've grown our program in states across all 50 states in the District of Columbia, we have to deal with different policies and procedures. There's a federal overlay to child welfare, but its implementation at the state level can be very different from state to state. Again, not unlike what Mr. Thomas understood um, in implementing a franchise system from state to state. Um, and so helping our board members understand that when we're creating public-private partnerships in states, inherent in that, again, is a lot of policy and advocacy and occasionally lobbying work in order to make those partnerships thrive on behalf of children. So absolutely, it's a continuing conversation with, with, with employees, with board members, with be careful what lines you step in or step over, particularly with social media and everybody's you know, wanting to get their voice expressed through social media. Let's just be cautious on, on how we're expressing something that might be a policy issue or, a, or, a, or a, an advocacy issue. Um, so all of that exists. Great question, absolutely. I have another question and this, some might say it's a curveball, but I have a feeling you're gonna knock it out of the park. <laughs> When you are talking about creating policy, is this a discussion in your strategic planning as well? Like as you're looking years ahead, do you and, and the visionary say, what are the policies that we have been successful in? And I hope that you'll share that with us here soon. But what are the policies um, and the advocacy work that we really want to sink our teeth into? So is that part of the bigger discussion? It is, it is always part of both the near-term and the long-term strategic discussion, absolutely. And I'll give you another example. So one of the issues in child welfare and in getting these children, particularly that focused population of children who are most at risk of aging out of care with an adoptive family, again, teenagers, children in sibling groups, children with special needs, children who are opposed to permanency because they've just given up on adults and family. What we have to address are what are those barriers that exist and frequently those barriers exist at the very front line level of social workers and judges right because of some belief systems that they may have. Um, and so part of what our, our recent strategic planning has been is creating, particularly at the bench with judges, who if a, if a child says, I don't want to be adopted, a judge says, oh, I want to respect that child's voice. So we'll put them on the emancipation track. In other words, we'll let them leave foster care without a family. Um, and what we have to do, we created a, a, an entire, our, our chief legal counsel created a, a, an incredible education piece on understanding permanency for people in the legal system, judges, attorneys, CASA guardians, ad litem, those people that have a profound impact on permanency for children, helping them understand. So it's not only an education piece, an advocacy piece, but at some point it may turn into, is there a piece of legislation that needs to happen that addresses what happens at, at the judicial level? We're not there yet. Um, and there's lots of things that already exist. We simply have to let people understand uh, what's behind those. But I think, um, yes, it, it absolutely has to be as you get into the depth and the complexities and the nuances of a cause. Again, it doesn't have to be foster care adoption. As you get into yeah. those nuances of a cause, there will always be policy issues that are either barriers to be addressed or perhaps um, um, entrance ways that have not yet been created to make things better. 
I love hearing that that is a piece of the strategic planning. And I feel that there's probably many organizations that are remiss in that discussion around the strategic plan. And, you know, as we talked a little bit earlier and you shared so eloquently the differences between, you know, lobbying, advocacy and policy work, that is a great place, that being the strategic planning discussion to start this conversation. Um, And I would love to hear some policy success stories uh, that you and your team have had, Rita. Sure. And, and it's a wonderful dance between service and policy, right? Again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not something that should be viewed separately or as, as, you know, our teams interact on all of these conversations, our program team and our business development team and our marketing team and our development team, they're always interacting on these conversations because they're so intricately linked. Um, some examples of policy, absolutely. When you think about our adoption friendly workplace program, right? Again, I'll go back to, to Dave Thomas, who um, as he was beginning this journey of creating a a foundation, um, he, I think we talked about this yesterday, just believed in his heart that there ought to be um, policies at, at a business level that say, if you give benefits to families that are formed through birth, you also should give benefits to families that are formed through adoption. And by extension, perhaps families that are fostering. And so we began a a specific program, the Adoption Friendly Workplace Program that encourages employers to put in place paid leave um, and and potentially financial uh, reimbursement for adoption expenses for their employees. But that was part of a larger initiative that said, where are those other resources that families need? For example, um, you know, at the federal level with, with family medical leave, there are policies already in place, but they didn't address adoption or foster care. And so advocating for at, at all levels, not just at a private business level, this notion of employee benefits for families that are formed through adoption or um, uh, foster care. And, and we weren't the only ones, but, but in 2020, the feds instituted, um, you know, a paid leave for families that are formed through a, through adoption. So that that arc of understanding that the benefit should be there and then how does that get translated into policy is critical. Another one is the adoption tax credit. So families need resources when they adopt out of foster care. Um, it's not expensive to adopt out of foster care, but there are other expenses. Um, just raising a child, putting a child through college. Uh, If you adopt a 12 year old, you haven't saved for that first 12 years for college. So all of those expenses that go into raising a child, um, we've been at at the forefront of advocating for a federal and state adoption tax credit for families who adopt um, so that they can um, um, have at least some recognition uh, at the end of the day that there's an expense to this, that it's a collective community responsibility and it can show up on something as simple as filing my annual taxes and getting a tax credit for having adopted. Um, I think another piece is is when we look at this this quest for us to have um, public-private partnerships in the states in order to expand one of our signature programs, the Wendy's Wonderful Kids program, that aggressively moves children out of foster care and into adoptive homes. One of the the, the tenets of this is that it's a co-investment relationship between the state and and philanthropy, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. But ultimately, because these children are in the custody of the state, they will take over the the majority of the expense of this program as it gets embedded as best practice, as the way of doing things for this vulnerable population of children. And and we look at where are the uh, resources available to states then that already exist, or are there some that should be created in order to recognize that it's their legal and moral responsibility to move these children out of foster care and into adoptive homes if, if the, the, the financial director of the state is saying we couldn't possibly afford to do this, it's our responsibility to look at where are the policies in place that they can afford to do this or where can we help them create um, um, strategies in order to make that happen. So those are just some of those examples where we're working both at a finance level, um, at, a, at, a, at a direct service level, um, and, and sometimes just at an a, a, a attitude change level that that advocacy works, I think, on behalf of Again, the, 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 the 122,000 children in this country who are simply waiting for a family and a home. 
And you had mentioned, and one of the reasons that Power Week is this week is that this month, November, is National Adoption Month, correct? Yes, 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 it is. And we, we work on this, the notion that everybody should know about children in foster care waiting to be adopted every day. But November gives us this incredible platform to really, you know, pull off, take off all the brakes and, 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 and let America know what this is, what foster care adoption is, who these children are, why it's important to think about them in your community and, and at a, at a, at a uh, national basis. Yeah. Now, question, you know, it's so interesting to see the arc of the story from one individual who was successful in business, moved through his life, funded this campaign. Uh, you know, it, the story in itself is just amazing. I'm wondering, is as you look at the landscape of the nonprofits, 1.8 million registered in our country, are you able to see other nonprofits or other foundations that are doing things that allow you to understand what it is that you could be doing? I mean, I feel like a lot of our viewers are going to be watching you to learn what it is that they can do with their own organizations that could be completely, obviously different. In, in scope and, and practice. But where have you garnered the information and the knowledge and the road path to doing these things? Personally, I, as, as a leader, I learned so much in collaboration. I learned so much in partnership with other great thinkers. And so I've worked really hard to make sure that I have this um, um, outreach and that I'm responsive to others reaching out to us, that we learn as much as we can about other organizations that are doing both similar things and maybe doing different things, but the, the, the strategies that they use are applicable to what we do. So that's been a, a profound part, I think, of of how I do business is it's always been collaborative. And we work in a number of, of informal and formal groups, some advocating for change in the child welfare system. It's a group of folks coming together. I work in, uh, I'm, I'm involved in a group of just almost exclusively faith-based organizations. We're not a faith-based organization, but so much of foster care and adoption happens through faith-based organizations as well. So being, um, understanding that and understanding how we can do that better. Look, there is, if we've learned nothing else over the past couple of years, there's a profound racial inequity and social justice conversation that has to continue in this country yeah. in a very big way. Um, yeah. It's been going on for decades, but, but it's been highlighted over the past couple of years. Um, and so looking at where do we fit in with those groups that are doing much better than we are probably on addressing the fact that there has always been an overrepresentation of children of color in the child welfare system. Why is that? Not because those parents are any worse than white parents, but because there are, there are systemic issues that have driven BIPOC children into the child welfare system at a much higher rate. And so our outreach over the past couple of years has been, where do we fit into this and how do we do this better? Um, it, it is about, and then we have these public-private partnerships. So understanding um, through the fund, fund um, uh, grant making that we do for programs, as we give grants to both public and private organizations, making sure that we're as smart as we can be with the, the differences that exist between child welfare systems across the states and across some counties in some states. It, we have to, the nature of our work demands that collaboration, but it is, I think, by nature who I am as well. I love it. Heavy load and there's a lot, you know, and so yeah. I applaud you. I applaud your entire team and the board, um, everyone that, that plays a role in this, um, as well as your investors, which some of us call them funders, some yep. of us call them donors, right? <laughs> um, and I'm curious, you know, as you engage in policy right here, you know, how do you talk about policy in a fundraising aspect? Mm -hmm. um, because Anytime politics or anything political is brought up, we all know because we've been around the block long enough, it can be divisive, right? And so does policy change help or hurt in your fundraising endeavors? For us, it has only helped. Um, 
I, I think I think that's absolutely true. It has only helped. And I, again, I'll give you a specific example. We had a potential donor uh, reach out to us. She was part of an investment group of women who were looking collectively at where they could invest their resources. And they they happened on the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. She wasn't uniquely connected to the cause, but they happened on us um, in some way. Uh, she really wanted to know one. How did we do research? What was the research? She wanted to understand our research and she very much wanted to stand, understand where did we immerse ourselves in policy and in advocacy and in lobbying. And so we, we shared all of that information with her over a couple of, of months time. Uh, unfortunately, the group decided to go in a different direction than the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. But interestingly, we stayed in touch with her because she was the one that had made the outreach uh, with, with whatever was going out with emails, with phone calls. Here's an update on where we're scaling this Wendy's Wonderful Kids program. Here are some issues. And she had an opportunity to ask more questions about where we were involved in public policy. We just learned about a month ago that she has written uh, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption into her will in a significant way. So that's an oh. example, I think, of uh, are there some individuals that are drawn to that and will want to be a part of investing in the organization? Of course, of course. Will it scare some people away? Look, we put a statement of justice up on our website after so many horrible things were happening across this country, uh, you know, just 12 months ago. We had some donors uh, email us, call us and say, because of some of the verbiage you have on there, we don't choose to donate to you anymore. I understand that. Our statement of justice is not a political statement. It is a human statement. And so if someone chooses to, to disagree with that, I, I applaud it. You don't have to be a donor. But for the most part, I think because people have seen the work that we take, the care that we take, the, the non-political positions that we take, this is not a political conversation. It's a human conversation that we have attracted. And, in, and even during the pandemic, an increased number of donors um, than we had the year before. Well, you know, Rita, even what you had mentioned earlier about having this group home setting and during COVID, you know, with not having ability to, um, you know, really distance on and looking at some of the policy as it relates to healthcare. For me, what I hear, you know, is it's education. It's education to all of us. And I am embarrassed to say, that never crossed my mind, right? Um, because I'm not in that world. And so for, for me to hear, you know, these statements, it's like, oh, well, of course that is of concern, you know, and, and it should be of concern. But for many of us that aren't in this day in and day out, like, like you and your team, um, it really is an educational opportunity for many of us. We shared with you, you know, yesterday, Julie and I both got off the conversation and we were like, Wow, we were so uh, just, you know, invigorated and inspired by the great work of the foundation. And there's always something for everyone to do. Um, so I just, I think it's fantastic. And I think that, you know, standing bravely in your human statements is so important. Well, and, and those conversations give us an opportunity to expand beyond child welfare. Um, look, I'm going to stay uniquely focused on the mission, but during COVID, when you're thinking about vulnerable children that are impacted, there are also vulnerable children that are not in foster care who are impacted because their families now are in economic distress, or they're in rural areas that don't have access to broadband and therefore are yeah. not getting the same kind of education opportunities that other children are. So it allowed us to also expand those conversations, keep focused on the mission, but, but again, create a sense of unity among, among those who are enmeshed in, in human issues through nonprofits to say, how can we work together on behalf of all of our children and families? Amazing. Well, this has been fabulous. We're only in day two on our Nonprofit Power Week with the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. You've been joined uh, by Jarrett, with Jarrett and I by um, amazing, amazing leadership talent and, and sage leader. Uh, Rita Sornan, really an amazing week. We've worked on this for a long time to really build a thread of, of different topics that weave together, whether this is your sector that you work in or not. I think the lessons here can cross over to all of us. And so we have several topics not to be missed. How do CEOs and development directors work together? That's gonna to be tomorrow. 
The power of collaboration, Rita, you mentioned that very, like in the very beginning of our show today, we already talked about meeting the leader and championing the idea of the founder. And then Friday will be our ask and answer specifically with Rita. So um, reach out to us if you have any questions for this uh, dynamic leader, uh, because there's really not to be missed. Here's Rita's information. Check out the Dave Thomas Foundation. They really have an amazing website that details how they do their work, where they do their work, and how communities across our country can get involved with them. Um, again, I'm Julia Patrick, been here today with my sidekick, Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself, CEO of the Raven Group. Wow, Jarrett, this has been amazing, and we want to make sure that we call out our sponsors who have gotten behind this week and this discussion because it's really super, super powerful. Nonprofit Power Week has got me engaged. What about you? Going strong. I'm excited. Tomorrow's going to be probably one of my favorites because talking, you know, with the CEO and the development director, so much of yesterday's conversation as well as today, you know, really threads into every day um, of these episodes. So you're right. Do not miss them. And of course, they will be archived so you can access them at any time because there's been a lot, Rita, that you said that I want to go back and hear again. So thank you. And thanks to everyone that joined us today. Thank it's, you. It's been wonderful. You know, as we end this day, we want to remind you to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thank you, ladies.